Kai is an area extension agent for the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension uh, Group. Um, that's uh, Kai. You're, I think you're headquartered in. Are you in Maricopa? Or are you? I'm in Phoenix at the you're Maricopa in County office. Yeah, yeah. And Kai covers. Let's see. You've been covering turf grass for 17 years. Is that right? Uh, since about 2004. Yeah. 16 years or so. Yeah. So before before becoming a, uh, the agent for turf grass, he was an associate extension agent for nine years covering veg vegetable crops. And then before that, he worked for American Cyanamon for 12 years in New Jersey. He got his bachelor of, did you get a BA or a BS from Cal? BS. Yeah, BS. Uh, in uh, pest management and a master's of science degree from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale in plant and soil science. And today, oh shoot, where to go? Let's see. Kai is going to talk to us about the utility of an LED light trap for insect pest monitoring in turf grass. Thank you, Kai. All right. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Steve, for organizing this uh, webinar series and uh, getting to be the first one to launch this program. We'll see how it proceeds and if people want to come back down the road. Uh, today, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about some of our turf grass insect situations that we have here in the desert. But when we talk about the monitoring program that we do have using light traps, it will have utility across the board, across a lot of other commodities and other flying insect pests. So I think it's going to be of interest to a lot of people beyond only turf grass. So uh, I'd like to start out talking uh, my collaborators, the um, light trap was invented, got started by Stu Buck, who is a consultant working with Spectron Labs in Scottsdale. And he got involved with Rick Brandenburg of North Carolina State University, who consults out here with uh, one of the clubs in North Scottsdale. And uh, the two of them started toying with this light trap. So I got in on it with them since I am local and uh, had a bit of interest in our insect pests in the desert. So began working with the both of them. And then here at the university, we have Shaku Nair, who is our associate in extension working with our community IPM group. And being an entomologist with turf experience out of Georgia, I've been trying to tow her more into working with me in um, the turf grass arena here in the desert. And a lot of this presentation that I'll be giving today is going to be based on information that was put together by a former research assistant of mine, Gabe Towers who's now with the Wilbur Ellis Company locally here. And he did a lot of the legwork and did a lot of the uh, data collection work during the in initial years when we got this program started. So I wanna make sure that the credit goes to a lot of these folks who've done a lot of the work in doing this project. As an introduction, want to get people acquainted with the fact that here in Arizona, we do have a unique climate and environment. And we do have a lot of turf grasses. There's about 300 golf courses here in Arizona. And we do have occasional insect pests, though they aren't as problematic as you would go to the south or to the northeast. We do have some insects. But with regards to the species, we don't know exactly what pests we have. And if they do invade our turf grasses, we don't know how many generations or even what 
part of the year they really are a problem in the turf. And then we don't know the exact timings of their emergence or their occurrences because of the different species that we might have or biotypes that we might have. And then certainly we don't know what the economic thresholds are. On high-end golf courses, the threshold is pretty much zero. And then on public and uh, other municipal courses and other turf areas, they become a little bit more uh, manageable and tolerable. And then when it comes to control strategies, the industry has been really good in coming up with a lot of good insecticides. So we don't have any significant issues with um, having efficacy of products. So what we like to do today now is, is describe for you how we got started with the limited amount of information that we have in the turf grass insects. Back when I started this program, as we mentioned, I got started in turf in about 2004. And one of the first contacts I had was with a superintendent and he had some beetles on his greens that were bothersome on his golfers, golf balls. And I didn't know what insects we were dealing with. So at that point, decided that we could set up a series of black light traps and start monitoring what kind of insects we did have in the Phoenix area. We set up uh, half a dozen light traps around the perimeter of the valley. We were up in the northeast Scottsdale area. We were way out east toward the Superstition Mountains in downtown Phoenix, and then going way out west toward Sun City and uh, the western part of the valley. And we eventually ended up with about 10 or so sites over the course of the three, four years that we were doing this project. But we did start out with the six sites and it represented a good number of um, different areas here in the Phoenix area. Then a few years ago, since we were using the black light traps that we were purchasing, a few years ago, Stu Buck of Scottsdale developed this new LED light trap. He has a self-contained unit that's solar powered. You can see the solar panel up on top there. And then what he did was have a battery. Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Okay. Share your screen. We're not we're not seeing your screen. It's not showing up. Uh, just go ahead and share it again. Oh, go. yep. We see it now. Is that showing now? Yep. No. yep. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. I'm sorry. No worries. Anyway, um, this solar powered LED light trap has a battery pack. And it's also got a timer on there on the back side. And it is only directional right now. It's not like the black light trap that is all around that is exposing 360 degrees. But this one here has those four little light bulbs and it shines directionally. And it does attract the insects and um, it fall it tracks them and it falls down through the bottom and there is a collection jar down at the bottom of this uh, unit and that's how you're able to at this point in time physically and manually see and count the insects the uh, locations that we've been working with the last few years has primarily been Desert Mountain Club, where Stu does a lot of his consulting. They've got six courses up there. And then up in the Scottsdale corridor, there's DC Ranch and Mirabelle. And then in Scottsdale, Talking Stick and Wildfire Golf Clubs. And then last year we recruited uh, Peoria Parks in the Northeast 
or northwest part of the valley. So we're trying to expand the breadth of users for this particular light trap. The light traps back in 2004, we were initially catching a broad spectrum of moths, including some webworm adults, army worm, and cutworms. And then the beetles, we were catching the mass chafers, black turf grass, titanius, and aphodius. And over time, during the trapping season, we found that the key pest was the mass chafer. That was the most abundant pest that occurred in all of the traps and all throughout the season. The other flying moths were occasional and very few of them appeared. So we basically determined that the mass chafer was our uh, key pest of turf grasses. And the differences amongst all the beetles that we can find here in Arizona on the left is a June beetle, the big green one is a fig beetle, and then the mass chafer is in the middle, and the black turf grass titanius or aphodius are small beetles that you see on the right. The grubs, they're all the C-shaped uh, grubs that result from these beetles, and they're all various sizes depending on which instars that you're uh, looking at. And uh, they are the mass chafers in the middle and the small BTA larvae, they could be um, early stage instars of some of these other larger beetles. So we don't really have an idea of exactly which pests we have, but we did find that the adults, the mass chafers, were the ones that we were catching the most. And here's the differences in appearance of the adults. And then the BTA, they are really tiny black beetles that also occur. They are abundant in some cases, in some areas of the valley, and during some parts of the year as well, during the summer season. But when you're looking at the BTA, we also have another very similar looking aphodius beetle. The only thing that you can tell the difference between the two is that the aphodius has little spurs on its hind legs. Otherwise, it's almost identical to the BTA. So even trying to separate those in the light trap was difficult to do. And then if you really wanted to get to the nitty gritty and try to sort out the grubs, the pads on the rasters do different between the two of them. And that's pretty much how we would have to go about trying to sort out all the different grub species that we would have in our turf grasses. A few years ago in 2018, up in Scottsdale, there was some injury on a turf during this time of the year. Transition was very slow with the Bermuda grass slow coming in. And we thought it was maybe the BTA or even the Photius. We sent it down to Tucson for um, identification. And between um, the folks in Tucson and Shaku, they were able to determine that this was a new beetle that was occurring in our Scottsdale Phoenix area turf grasses, and that's the Hybosaurus beetle. And uh, we don't know if it is a pest in turf or what its status is. It's just something new that um, we're now trying to begin addressing. The grubs damage our turf. They slowly cause injury, tearing up the roots, chewing up the roots, and you see it eventually on the foliage up on the top. 
it browns out. You see necrotic areas and uh, dieback areas in turf grasses. The grubs um, last year during the fall season up at the desert mountain area, this was the first time that I saw any numbers as you see right here. Previously, I just thought that maybe a handful at most would be a problem, but when we were seeing these numbers, it made me a believer that we do have beetles as a problem in our turf grasses. They may not necessarily be a problem all the time, but the secondary damage when you get the javelina, skunks, and raccoons that come out of the desert, come out onto the golf courses and cause the secondary damage. This is where we have the issues. The uh, animals are tearing up the golf course fairways and rough areas and any place they can find grubs and turf and they just wreak havoc. So this is the primary reason why we have the issue with uh, grubs. You mentioned that we determined that the mass chafers were the primary pests in our turf grasses, but we do have other mass chafers in the U.S. And we think that we probably have the westerns, the southwesterns, and then also in the desert in Southern California and Arizona, we have a Pasadena mass chafer. And this critter was found by uh, Wendy Galerter over at Pace in um, San Diego. So we possibly have three chafer populations. The traditional chafers, usually in the Midwest, you'll have them emerging about this time of the year. They lay eggs and then they hatch and then they're feeding and they go through the winter in the soil, pupate in the late spring, and the adults are emerging. Here in Arizona, we're not quite sure what our populations are doing. The six sites during that first year around 2004, this is what we were seeing at the six locations. We had very few in some sites, as high as 25 late in the season in some other sites. And starting as early as June and then into mid-July was another peak. And then into September, we were seeing peaks. So we're not quite sure what the beetles were doing. So with a couple of peaks, we thought, could there be two species occurring in the early part of the summer and then maybe even into the late fall at the overseeding time? Or because there's possibly three peaks, is there an early, a midsummer, and an early fall population? We're not quite sure if this is a scenario or if it's the same beetle species or biotype that might be emerging at all different times of the summer. I did mention that we do have sod webworms aren't necessarily a problem in our desert turf. Cutworms occur. We see them flying around and then occasionally on greens on the golf courses you might see some immatures. And then army worms, we rarely see them, but they do occur occasionally. Going to the light traps again, we do see that some of the early data that Stu and Rick were working with at the Desert Mountain Clubs, the trap catches were very similar to the old blacklight traps. There might be some differences at the beginning of the season where the LED traps may not have been catching as many, but then at the end of the season, they appeared to be catching more than the uh, traditional blacklight traps. So they are effective in catching them, how they relate, uh, we'd like to be able to determine for sure down the road. 
here's a graphic showing that the LED trap is pretty effective in catching these, and um, they do compare favorably with the black light trap. These uh, LED light traps, they do catch the flying insects, and Rick has been also trying to incorporate some kind of an audio system in trying to attract mole crickets, and he's been working with this back in North Carolina and then also in Puerto Rico. And then I think that here in Arizona, in the southwest part down in Yuma, there's potential for light trap use in uh, some of the produce production season when you have moths flying, your army worms and your uh, diamondback moths. There could be possibility to incorporate the use of this LED light trap for the produce season. And then agronomic crops, you also have uh, cotton here in Arizona, but then when you get out to the other parts of the country, um, you could look into soybeans and corn as well as cotton. And then tree fruits and nuts, you have a lot of flying insects there, and there's potential for scouting and utilizing these light traps in those areas. And then the same for ornamentals in production or in uh, landscapes. The interesting part of what Stu is trying to develop, he's got a really um, interesting mind that he likes to toy as an engineer. And he's foreseen the opportunities down the road to incorporate a biometric identification system into that uh, light trap where insects could be identified by species as they go through that throat into the collection jar. Or you may not even need a collection jar because that biometric ID uh, system would e easily be able to count the species as they fall through and then also be able to keep that data and be able to upload it to the cloud and a superintendent or a, a pest control advisor could easily walk by that light trap and get the data immediately using a smartphone or a mobile device. So he has these really, um, neat ideas to be able to eventually maybe use this in a really innovative way and eliminate that dirty s separation and counting that uh, we typically have to do with the uh, old style bucket black light traps. So that's pretty much it. Really quick introduction to the um, light trap that we've been trying to see if we have the utility and uh, potential use in turf grasses as well as hopefully down the road in other crops. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them or try to. Shaku's along board with us too, so she could certainly help out. Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention, if I may, uh, that Stu also has, apart from the light trap itself, he also has this very cool uh, reporting system online called getbugs.com, uh, where uh, we, where all of the participant uh, golf courses can actually record their data, and everyone can see it across the courses, and and you know, it can also you know, offer graphs and other uh, plots of the data, which is very helpful. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah, what he has in mind is eventually getting a lot of people engaged with this light trap and being able to communally share the information. And, um, that way they would get an idea of what the performance of the trap is but um, also amongst 
end users at sites that they would then be able to share uh, community data. Of course, we find very unique that the uh, light trap will attract the beetles, but um, a lot of times one golf course across the street from another will have totally different populations of beetles. So up at uh, the northwest part of the valley, up in Sun City Grand, one golf course was inundated with beetles and chafer problems, and another one across the road had virtually none. And he hadn't needed to worry about spraying anything on that course, whereas the other course he had to do some treating. So these beetles are unique in how they select what they want to eat and where they want to eat. And so if we can make these available broadly, have them as broad use, broadly used as possible by all golf courses or even multiple numbers on golf courses, high and low population areas or altitude elevation areas, um, wooded areas or what have you that you might be able to see differences. Yeah, Kai, um, did you see the question? There's a question in the chat box from Andrew. Yeah, I, you see it? I, I can't. Do you want me to read it? But I don't. Sure, Matt, go ahead. If he cannot see it, then. I can't get the question. I'm tapping. Matt? So the question was, how exactly does the system count and identify trapped specimens? So he gets that's some. Something that, that's something that Stu is still working on. Right now, we're still manually counting the numbers each night in the jar that you saw on that particular unit. Um, he's eventually foreseeing being able to have that biometric counting and identification system incorporated into the unit. That's a little bit down the line yet. Right now, he's just trying to get these built. He's building them himself using a 3D printer. And uh, the white uh, background that you saw is basically uh, fabricated on a printer. So, um, it's very early in the process, but the concept, we're trying to prove it, and so far it's uh, looking promising. Great. Yep, thank you, Kai. Any other questions for Kai? Yeah, I, Andrew had another or, question there. Me, it's it's Andrew. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know if you saw my second question because it doesn't discriminate between my first and second question here in the chat. But how about bycatch? You know, other organisms. Um, do you get similar bycatch as with traditional blacklight systems, or maybe less or more? Um, that part we're still wanting to validate that because um, I've only seen the beetles and we don't have sufficient enough numbers of webworms or army worms or cutworms flying that I have not seen them. I set that trap up in my backyard here and I don't think uh, the other superintendents were necessarily looking for other flying insects. They were primarily looking for the chafer beetles in their uh, jars. So uh, the extent of what we're able to catch, we still need to figure that out. Yeah. But as I mentioned, Rick Brandenburg is trying to expand it to even using a sound system to be able to use and catch uh, mole crickets with it. So th this is Stu Buck. Um, yeah, we, we catch multiple flying insects uh, 
whether it's moths or June beetles. Um, so there's a there's quite a variety. It's just a matter of with the LED we have we have the capability of selecting what wavelengths uh, we want to work with. Um, and so rather than the black light with a very, which even though it's focused with the ultraviolet, um, there's quite a broad spectrum of, of light waves that are associated with that. So with the LEDs, we actually have the ability to select uh, specific wavelengths. So here in my lab, um, I have spectrophotometers where I can identify what wavelengths are strong, uh, what are insulary wavelengths uh, uh, that's, that's associated with it. So on, on some of the light traps, we actually have multiple um, wavelengths to see, uh, we wanted to be able to find out if we're, we're seeing an um, uh, increase of organisms trapped are attracted because of the multiple wavelength versus a singular wavelength at 385 nanometers. Um, relative to one of the earlier questions about the um, uh, identification, uh, we're currently working on, a, a, like Kai mentioned, at the throat uh, where it passes through into the collection bottle. Um, in that section, there'll be cameras um, that are identified with, with LEDs to lighten the area um, and so as the insect falls onto a platform um, LED is triggered cameras are triggered so we have three different angles um, and then uh, basically once the camera is, once we've captured the images uh, then the the organism will actually be zapped and it'll just fall through so there won't be any collection device we want to be able to have it so that it's a uh, um, you know, you set it and forget it concept. If it's out there monitoring, we want to make sure that it's monitoring remotely and that the data, like the images, um, as well as the uh, weather information at the time of the capture, uh, to be, you know, uh, um, through cellular communication, be using the 2G wavelength uh, um, that will actually transmit that up into the cloud ser services. Thanks, Stu. Yeah, thank you, Stu. Good to hear thank you. you. There was one additional comment in the in the chat, which was um, I don't know if everyone saw it. It is uh, yep. from Kirk Smith about the microscope Microsoft developing a mosquito trap that can count and identify mosquitoes. Kirk, do you want to say anything else about that, or are we good there? That part I can't chime in on that too much. Yeah. I think Kirk, Kirk was just letting us, uh, you know, sharing that information Yeah, that is being developed. Yeah, yeah that, that's kind of some uh, interesting because they're actually using the, um, the audio portion uh, to sense the, right. the, the sound frequency uh, coming off of the mosquitoes. So it was really kind of an interesting right. uh, paper. Okay. S Steve, do you want me to go ahead and... Yeah, I think we should we should move on and get to Ian and leave so we have right. time for questions for him. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll go a little past the hour, of course, to, to make sure we right. get through. Thank you. Kai and Shaku, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I mean, we, we'll be here. <laughs> Ian, do you want me to introduce you or you want to just go ahead? Oh, I can just go ahead. Um, oh. Okay. I, yeah, it, unless you have some words made up, I don't want to trample you, but uh, I can just get No, it. I just I just couldn't believe it that you managed to do your research in some of the most beautiful places in the nor in North America and most of the rest of us are, you know, in cotton fields and and the like. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it Matt, is you introduce him. What's that? I was just saying to Matt, you should introduce him. We didn't, we didn't introduce him at the top. So Okay. So Ian is the National Restoration Director at the American Conservation Experience. He got his bachelor's degree from Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. And uh, as I just said, he has done work in some of the most beautiful and picturesque areas in North America. He worked as a student at Shenandoah National Park. I've been to that park. It's drop-dead gorgeous. 
Lake Mead, which I think is probably the aquatic invasive species capital of North America. Oh. And uh, Grand Teton National Park as a wildland firefighter. So Ian's talk today is titled uh, Restoration Effects on the Little Colorado River. Ian, take it away. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Ian Torrance. I'm the National Restoration Specialist for the American Conservation Experience. And in this talk, I may refer to my organization as ACE. So don't be confused if when I say ACE, you're thinking of a hardware store. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, so let me get started. Um, let me share my screen. And what I'm going to do, too, is I'm going to turn my video off because my bandwidth isn't so great at my house. So um, do that. Do this. Now, can everyone see that? Yes, indeed. Great. Cool. So I, we need to start with a setting. We need to put you in the right place. Um, and uh, the, this presentation is talking about a project that's happening on the Little Colorado River, or I may refer to it later uh, as the LCR, the Little Colorado River headwater. Uh, so uh, the, the LCR headwaters originate in Arizona's East Central White Mountains, and the river flows north from there about uh, 340 miles and empties into the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, so the river drains about 27,000 square miles of Arizona's Painted Desert and Western New Mexico. Uh, the headwaters and tow waters, if you can call that a term, uh, flow year round. However, the middle portion of the LCR between the towns of St. John's, Arizona and Cameron, Arizona, flow only during spring snow melt and summer monsoon activity. Uh, the, the lower Colorado River forms one of the largest arms of the Grand Canyon and Located just south of Wapaki National Monument, where the where the river flows through, uh, there's the 185 foot high Grand Falls, um, and this, to give perspective, is higher than Niagara Falls. So it's a bigger fall than Niagara Falls. However, because of the way the water flows in this area, you can have this in one month, and then the next month you have this. So it's feast or famine when it comes to water in this watershed, in this section of the river. So let's talk about our partners uh, for this project. Um, the project takes place on the 130 year old Babbitt ranches. The ranch owns 270,000 acres of land between the San Francisco peaks and Grand Canyon in Northern Arizona. And the ranch is made up of three, three ranches, the SP, Cataract, and CO Bar ranches. They're known for their cattle production and raising quarter horses. People pay a lot of money for both of these, both of these animals. However, uh, they don't just raise horses and cows. Uh, the Landsword Foundation is the nonprofit arm of Babbitt Ranch. Uh, Landsword is, is focused on, this Landsword Foundation is focused on charity, science, and education endeavors. Uh, they've done work on uh, Golden Eagle work, uh, black-footed ferret reintroductions, and they've done a number of studies, archeology span and environmental studies on their properties. Uh, and a little known fact, all 12 astronauts who have set foot on the moon have trained on Babbitt ranches because it's kind of like a moonscape out there. They've done, NASA's done a lot of training out there. So, uh, so the project site, which I'll be talking about later, is home to one of 10 Southwest Environmental Garden Arrays or SEGA sites, S-E-G-A, operated by Northern Arizona University's Merriam Powell Center for Environmental Research. 
The focus of these Sega sites is on the planting of naturally occurring genetic variants of native cottonwoods and willows as part of a climate change riparian restoration research project. It's a mouthful. All this is run by Professor Thomas Wyndham at NAU. So American Conservation Experience, ACE, where I work, we're a national nonprofit as well. And we assist federal, state, local, and other nonprofit land managers in resolving land management issues while providing transferable and professional experience to young adults passionate in resource management. Uh, we're headquartered in Flagstaff, Arizona, but we have crew and intern offices in Arizona, California, Utah, Texas, and North Carolina. So uh, two maps kind of converge together here. This shows us or shows you the restoration projects that we've done in 2018. Um, I don't have an updated map for 2019 yet, but uh, so this is just restoration. We also do a lot of trail work and forestry projects as well. So let's dive in a little deeper and talk about our LCR site specifics. As I mentioned previously, the LCR relative to our project site is an intermittent river that flows with monsoon and winter snow melt. So we have this, which quickly can become this, a very uh, canoeable or kayakable uh, system if you want uh, to do that. Um, the LCR was dubbed the Rio Almedia or the river of cottonwood grows by early explorers due to the density of cottonwood galleries they encountered along its banks. However, due to climate change, human manipulation, invasive plant encroachment, and wildfire, these large cottonwood forests have become the minority instead of the majority. So here's an example of one of the wildfires that happened about a half mile from our project site. So it's there, it's a reality, this stuff is happening. Historic photos show us the drastic increase in invasive plant cover in this water system. Uh, this increase in plant cover, mostly invasive, has channelized the river, deepening the water table, and it's also added vegetation that has altered the river's course, changing the historic wide and slow flow pattern of this river to a narrow and fast pattern. These photos were taken, the one on the left in Cameron, which is about 10 miles downriver of our project site, and Woodruff is about 50 miles upstream from our project site. So you can see the before and after and how much invasive plant mostly tamarisk salt cedars come into this system. So the Little Colorado River Valley Conservation Area Pro Restoration Project. <clears throat> we all know how important our southwestern riparians, riparian areas are. They are few and far between, and they cradle the development of most southwestern vertebrates and avian species including many critically threatened species. So here's a map of the Little Colorado River Valley Conservation Area, all the way to the right side. There's that um, yellow and black dotted line. That's the right-hand version or the right-hand edge of the, of the conservation area uh, where that red dot is. Um, and and it shares uh, some of its area with the Antelope Prairie Ecological Research Area. So the, the Little Colorado River Valley Conservation Area encapsulate, encapsulates about six, a 16 mile stretch of the western banks of the LCR within CO Bar Ranch, one of those three ranches I mentioned to you earlier that make up Babbitt Ranches. The conservation area is nearly 17,000 acres in size, and land ownership is split between Babbitt Ranches, so private property, Arizona State Trust Land, Bureau of Reclamation Land, and Bureau of Land Management. 
the east side of the LCR is owned by the Navajo Nation. Roughly 1,500 acres of the conservation area is comprised of southwest riparian woodland. However, the majority of this acreage is made up of invasive salt cedar. How, and there are still isolated pockets of ecologically valuable remnant cottonwood, desert olive, and willow stands. So uh, all of our project sites within the conservation area have been chosen because of the significance they have. Um, they still have remnant cottonwood, galleries, willow, desert olive, and a slew of other natives like four-winged saltbush, milk vetch, spiny aster, snakeweed. There's a myriad of other native plants out there as well. Also, uh, the conservation area is actively used by wildlife. Here we've got a porcupine that has watched us do a lot of project work up in the upper left, and then uh, the golden eagles down there in the lower right. Uh, just a quick list of other mammals that use the conservation area as well as reptiles and uh, 169 bird species have been identified in a perennial cattle tank about five miles to the west of the conservation area. So we know that birds use this area a lot too. So by taking advantage of sites that already contain groups of hardy native vegetation, we've, we've given ourselves an advantage when creating riparian refugia. We're using integrated pest management to eliminate invasive plant competition for resources, establish fire breaks, and create space for additional revegetation opportunities. Though we're actively restoring several sites along the LCR within the conservation area, we're just gonna focus on this particular site, our first restoration site today. Uh, it's adjacent to NAU's SEGA site, which I mentioned earlier. So NAU's SEGA site in this photo are those three earthen ponds. Um, and that area was cleared with heavy equipment. The Tamarisk was cleared by heavy equipment. And our site, is right there. Um, you can barely make out kind of the white sticks. Those are our cottonwoods. And here's a little better view of the project site from an aerial shot. Um, so uh, I'll come back to this shot again later. So the Little Colorado River Valley Conservation Area is unique because we have the opportunity to achieve invasive plant control through all four IPM methods, physical control, chemical control, cultural control, and biological control. And so I'm gonna kind of go through those with you and how we've been using those to do work to create refugia. So yeah, uh, ACE has a lot of crews and we do a lot of hard work. Um, and so we are well outfitted to do manual and chemical control of salt cedar. We do this uh, in this site, we've been using trichlopier based herbicides like Garlon 4 and Garlon 3A. So we use the cut stump method with chainsaws and spray the stumps afterwards. So we take something that looks like this and turn it into something like this, or our photo from before, here's our project site, the red lines outlie it, and keep your eye on the red arrow for comparison's sake. We do that, eliminating salt cedar, here's a ground view of the project site. Uh, the greenery that you see is not resprouting tamarisk, but native Allen Rolfia or iodine bush. Here's, here it is another ground level. And again, the greenery is, is iodine bush, not resprouting tamarisk. 
And we come back and retreat uh, the stumps that we miss um, when they resprout. So we do you use basal bark treatments. And we remove the biomass. On this project, we physically removed it off site, um, but we're planning on using fire at a later time and we're also uh, leaving some piles for wildlife habitat. Then we fence these sites to keep out feral livestock, not babbit livestock, but babbit doesn't graze in this area, but uh, there's a lot of livestock that um, uh, comes over the river from, from the Navajo Nation. <clears throat> so we got to protect what we've done. And OHVs, uh, humans are down here as well, and they like to rip it up too. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other weeds that we have to deal with on this location, like the worst weed, camel thorn. And we also have Russian knapweed, silverleaf nightshade, and some Russian olives. So we're, we take an EDRR approach, or early detection rapid response approach, uh, to our small uh, infestations. Uh, the, nap, the, the Russian knapweed, the nightshade, and the Russian olive, those populations are really small, so we're, we're able to, to nip those in the bud. However, with camel thorn, which covers this site, it's ubiquitous, uh, we're taking more of a cultural IPM stance on this. Um, due to the presence of the sensitive and expensive native plantings on the NAU Sega site, and some of the herbicide persistence and soil mobility and label application rates, we've, we've decided to forgo herbicide treatment on this site on camel thorn. And instead, we are instigating the use of competitive native plant plantings uh, like alkali and sacatone and saltgrass. Um, they, they can be transplanted easily. They're really hardy and robust, and they are naturally doing a good job of excluding uh, camel thorn in some areas. Though we, we had nothing to do with it, nor can we do anything about it, the tamarus beetle is on our site. So we've got some biocontrol going on. Um, and they're doing a great job of keeping the salt cedar from flowering and seeding. And, and some people may ask, uh, and I'm just gonna make a statement that the, the LCR is not, well, this section of the LCR is not endangered southwestern willow fly catcher habitat, so we don't have to worry about that issue on this site. So we're, we're also actively revegetating the sites, either naturally or with plantings. Uh, here's a photo from last summer. Uh, we had a huge uh, crop of uh, uh, cottonwoods come in uh, after a storm. Um, and you can see them there, very little tamarisk. Um, it's probably like 100 cottonwood seedlings to two tamarisk, so the timing was right. Um, so this, this system is still functioning. Uh, and then here we have the NAU, some of the, a picture of NAU's plantings. Uh, you can see them in the cages, these cottonwoods in the cages and the irrigation running to them. There's a well down there. And so we're able to run water to all the plantings on this site. Um, and NAU's doing some studies. Um, they're using mycorrhizal fungi uh, to see if that increases reveg success. They're looking at seedling, cottonwood seedlings versus co cottonwood cutting success rates. They're looking at different soils. There's sandy soils, clay soy, soils, salty soils down there. Um, then, like I mentioned before, they're looking at genetics. How does local stock do versus stock from hotter, drier climates? And then they're also studying the use of nurse plants, like planting cottonwoods, pairing cottonwood seedlings with, with willows and or grasses. So a lot of cool stuff going on down there. I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, so we do have site challenges. Like I said, it's feast or famine. We get down there and we're wading up to our thighs in floodwaters on this site, or we are digging five, six, seven feet down to, to get to the water table to get water to water these cottonwoods. It's also a very remote site. It can take two hours one way from Flagstaff to get there. 
Um, there's no cell service. It's a long, rough dirt ro road drive in. Um, it's remote. Our crews, when they're doing the work down there, they'll camp down there for weeks at a time. So besides creating successful riparian refugia, our other goals include applying a community approach to restoration. Instead of focusing on a single species, we need to incorporate all plant life that's down there and use what works. Uh, closing the knowing and doing gap between practitioners and scientists. I'm a practitioner. These folks are scientists in AU. Um, so we learn from one another, we work together, and we make things happen. Uh, we want to replicate a successful restoration model along the rest of the lower Little Colorado Valley Conservation Area. And we also want to involve our neighbors, our, our, like the Navajo Nation, the Park Service at Wapaki National Monument, and towns like Cameron, Winslow, and Holbrook, who, who are local to this project site. I'm, off, I'm often asked, uh, why do we use these methods, the cut stump method with chainsaws and herbicide? Why not incorporate heavy equipment and fire? Well, for these sites, for now, we're able to do the hand thinning without archaeological clearance. Um, and, and you need that for fire and heavy equipment use. And due to the proximity to established native plants and their root systems, fire and heavy equipment might pose damage to these plants. It's proven that ground disturbance by heavy equipment and fire proliferates herbaceous invasive plant spread, especially on this site. The camel spore comes in like, like wildfire after uh, heavy equipment grazes the surface of the earth. Uh, and then heavy equipment and fire eliminate unseen small native plant life and, and, and seed sources. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that this is a classroom and I work for a conservation organization and this is a great opportunity to, to teach practical science-based knowledge to, to budding land managers. So uh, just to mention some of our funding in the past, uh, we worked through a Wildlife Conservation Society grant um, that was supplemented uh, with money from the Landsward Foundation and Arizona Game and Fish. And then in 2000, and we got a 2019 Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management Invasive Plant Grant to do more work. And then we're also actively looking and applying for, for more funding. So in conclusion, this native cottonwood seedling here, surrounded by this invasive camel thorn, kind of rep represents just how tough it is out here at, at this site. Some folks have likened our project site to a restoration black hole, but uh, we're out to prove them wrong by using a myriad of invasive plant control options, thinking outside the standard restoration toolbox, making mistakes and learning from them, and most importantly, employing diverse voices and a breadth of practical and science-based expertise. This has got to be one of the most stressful restoration environments in the lower 48 states. So we're emboldened to see so much positive progress so far. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Yep. So Ian, more of a comment than a, than a question. Yeah. Uh, it looks like you've managed to find another drop dead gorgeous place to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think so, but some people think it's pretty hot and dry down there. Uh, it depends on the time of year, I think, just like everywhere. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a cool project site and it's one I've kind of taken to heart, so. So how many acres can you restore at a time? And what sort of pace are you setting in these kinds of areas and environments? Yeah, so um, with old growth tamarisk, so um, these thick, thick stands like you saw in that photograph, uh, monotypical stand, you can barely wade through it. 
Um, our crews, an eight person crew can cut and treat and remove the biomass. Um, it's about a half acre uh, per hitch, which is two weeks. So it's very slow in it and it's very, very expensive, not gonna lie about it. But we, we you know, like the reasons I said, um, it's a good way to, to kind of save seed sores, prevent weed spread, and, and kind of be the surgical tool around these, these native plants. Um, in the process, we've uncovered a lot of plants, native plants that we didn't think existed there. So that was good. And then um, it, we've given the opportunity for that iodine bush, which was there to kind of proliferate. It's definitely more robust now than, than it was underneath the, the salt cedar uh, canopy. So that, but we do have plans to utilize um, heavy equipment and fire at a later date in kind of, once we've finished these isolated patches, there, there are huge patches of, of salt cedar where we, we can use that kind of equipment and techniques to, to get rid of larger stands um, much more cheaply and, and quicker. So Ian, Kai had a question that he posted in the chat, which yep. was, can, oh, you saw it? No, no, go ahead, you read it. Oh. Yeah, can native grasses like Sacaton, and I might not be pronouncing that correctly, yep. be seeded during the monsoons? Yeah, so yes, you can seed. Um, we, I just had a talk with Tom Whittem yesterday about this because he's really interested in it. We don't know when the best time to seed is. I think the best time to seed would be before winter. So winter, the rains are, are less hard than a monsoon uh, storm. And also there's a possibility of snow as well, which um, is a much better way to, to get seeds to, to grow. So um, yeah, but we need to look at that. Um, but what we do know, and we already have established, is that we can take stacketone and salt grass from this site, pull them up, dig them up with a shovel, walk them over to where we want them and drop them in the hole, water them once or twice, and they're good to go, and they green up again. Really hardy plant, um, uh, and I think it's gonna be a good, uh, good test for the camel thorn. Shaku, do you wanna read your question or do you want me to read it? Um, I can read it. Okay. Hi, Ian. Uh, fascinating project. Thank you for sharing your uh, experiences there. My question was, uh, do you encounter any wildlife in these sites, uh, particularly yeah. rodents? I was interested in that. And do they cause any problems? Uh, rodents, you said? Yeah. And yeah. other wildlife, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'll start big and work down. Um, yeah, the cows are there for sure, and the horses are there for sure. Uh, we're always dealing with them. That's why the fence is put up. Um, and then we have coyote. You saw the porcupine there. Uh, pretty big birds. I'm pretty sure we saw a pelican last year fly through the site. Wow. Um, it's really kind of weird. A lot of things happen down there. Um, uh, coyote and uh, possibly badger. And then... Okay. Um, but yes, we do have, they have problems with, with rabbit uh, on the re-veg sites. So that, that's why they have to mm -hmm. cage them or put them in uh, tubex uh, okay. to, to keep the predation down. Thank you. Yeah. No snakes? Uh, I'm sure there is. We don't mm -hmm. have a pro. I mean, we've never had a problem. I haven't seen a snake down there yet, but um, I could, we've had a myriad of crew members down there and, um, over a long span of time, I'm sure someone's seen a snake, but I, I threw up a, a list of, of, uh, reptiles that could be on this site. And there, there was a fair number of stakes that use this area as habitat. So, yeah, I saw crotalus on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Kai has one additional question. He said, um, how far has bio has the biological control agent, I, I presume he's referring to the beetle yeah. uh, progressed. 
Yeah, so they released the Beatle, uh, maybe it was approved in 2001, I can't remember, maybe released in 2004 uh, in the Moab area, southeastern, uh, yeah, southeastern Utah. Um, and then there was an accidental release in the St. George area, so southwestern Utah. It was an illegal release, but um, the Beatle is doing really well. It's moving faster and uh than they ever thought it would um so it's if you were to go it's in texas it's all the way down in the uh pecos and rio grande rivers uh all the way down with the border with with mexico um north i, I believe you know they've seen it in in it's in northern nevada so um, it's all the way down the Colorado River, um, down into Imperial National Wildlife Refuge, which is almost getting close to the border near Yuma. So, um, and it's moving, it's west as well, uh, or sorry, going east as well into um, Kansas, uh, Colorado, Kansas. So it, it's widespread. If you go to, you can go to Rivers Edge West, dot com and uh, or dot org i can't remember just google rivers edge west and they have a whole they're kind of the the clearinghouse or the holding facility for all this tamarisk beetle information and they have maps that you can look at and shows all the points where it's been identified and in, in every year over the last 10 years so. yeah that used to be the tamarisk coalition yep exactly Any other questions? We're about at time. Um, and if not, Ian, thank you. Everyone, yep. thank you. Um, great presentations, Kai, as well. We'll do this again in a month and uh, look forward to the next time around.